Well, as I mentioned, I was uh, with that group of pastors that wall builders gathered together for a pastor's briefing, and uh, David Barton does a wonderful job giving a spiritual tour of the Capitol and uh, showing us various things, statues and pictures, just amazing, amazing history. And I've done that tour with him a couple of times and always learned something new, but this time we got to do something I've never been able to do before. We went into not just the belly of the beast, but the belly of the belly of the beast. That is, we went into the chambers of the houses, House of Representatives, you know, where you see the uh, uh, State of the Union speech delivered and where when on TV you see the various representatives giving their speeches for and against a particular piece of legislation. And uh, so it was quite an honor to be able to go into that room and, and uh, look around and sit in those big leather overstuffed chairs that we were told are bulletproof because I guess there was some terrorists, some Puerto Rican terrorists years ago that came in with a machine gun, shot the place up, and so now they got bulletproof backs of the chairs they can duck behind when the bullets come flying. Uh, they're, they're afraid. Um, and uh, got to stand at one of those podiums where, where the uh, representatives speak in the well and uh, address the other uh, representatives there assembled. And uh, when we, we sat in the chairs, they showed us, here, here's the buttons in front of you. You see, you've you got to put a card reader in. That's your identification as a, as a representative. And then you push the button, yay, nay, abstain, and uh, present, I guess, was the other one. It's like, hmm, what's the difference between abstain and present? I don't know. But anyway, the four buttons, so you realize, wow, okay, here's where all this happens. And you see on TV that room, and it really looks, I don't know, it really looks big. It seems bigger than it actually felt when I was there. And it seemed, of course, with all the TV lights and all, it seemed much brighter than it felt kind of drab. And, of course, it was late at night, uh, 9.30 or, or later, and so maybe that was part of it. But it seemed, the room seemed kind of drab to me in, in contrast with what I had seen pictures of it. And as I was sitting there thinking and as I ran my fingers over those buttons that they used for voting, and that day they were told that they passed four votes, um, and no doubt those four votes involved spending a lot more money, as every time they hit those buttons it seems like they only spend a lot more money. Thinking about the fact that in their voting, they are spending 40% more money than they're taking in, which tells us one thing, they're plunging us deeper and deeper and deeper into permanent servitude as debtor nation, not just ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren. The young people here, they're going to face a debt that won't be repaid in their lifetime or their children's lifetime or their grandchildren's life. It's going on maybe forever. In other words, they're making slaves out of us. It's what they're doing with those votes, where they spend more money than they take in. And as I got to thinking about that, I, I've been reading through the Gospel of Luke and, and, and moving up towards that eventful day of Good Friday, and of course this Sunday coming up is Palm Sunday, and a phrase that Jesus used on Palm Sunday struck me with a full force while I sat there. He said when he went into the temple of God and he saw what was taking place there, he said, this is a den of thieves. That's what he called the temple of God, a den of thieves, because the people who were buying and selling and the money changers were stealing out of the pockets of the people who came in there. And I thought, that's exactly what this House of Representatives has become, a den of thieves. And one of the pastors there uh, asked if we could pray for the people who meet in that room. And so I got down on my knees, and a group of us pastors prayed for those representatives, prayed for their repentance, prayed that they would fulfill their oath and and prayed that they would uh, find saving faith in Jesus Christ before it's too late for them and they pass into eternity. But that whole idea of government becoming a den of thieves struck me with, with real, real great force, and, and that's some of what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Well, in our series, Foundational Principles of Freedom, in our first and second lessons, we study the biblical underpinnings of law and the foundation of liberty, we establish the logical as well as the historic fact of law, and that is that there is a creator God and that he is the one that determines what is right and wrong. He is the one that determines what is good and what is evil, not man. And that's the most important foundational principle of law and justice. If this principle is not understood as absolute and undeniable truth, you can conclude then that everything stated by the Declaration of Independence is not true. It's a lie, because the Declaration of Independence is based upon that truth. See, if there's any shadow of a doubt in your mind and in your thinking of the fact that the God of the Bible is our creator, 
and that he and he alone is the one totally independent of the will of man that determines right and wrong, determines good and evil, then I would encourage you to review the first two lectures uh, because until you have a thorough understanding of this concept and a full grasp of that fact, then and only then will the rest of this lecture series make any logical sense to you. Now, while every word of our founding charter, the Declaration, is important, perhaps the second most important principle of freedom to understand is that our rights come from God, not from government. Our rights come from God, and therefore they are not subject to the repeal or the restrictions of any human laws. Now, that's a shocking statement in our day, but let me unfold that in this lecture. Because the Declaration of Independence, as you well know, states we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So if the proper role, as the Declaration clearly says here, if the proper role of government is to secure our God-given unalienable rights, it's essential that we understand and have an, an accurate definition of what that term meant when it was written. In other words, what are our founders mean when they use that term unalienable? Well, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is, by the way, was written to help inform future generations as to what the words meant at the founding era. So 1828 gives us what the founders meant by these words. If you look up the word alienable in 1828 Dictionary, it says that may be transferred to another. And if our founders, therefore, wanted to indicate that their rights, that they were speaking about here in this document, their rights could have been transferred to their elected representatives when they voted for them, in order for those elected representatives to regulate those rights, to control those rights, if that was the case, they would have used this term, alienable. They did not choose to describe our rights as alienable. They said they were un. Alienable. That is, they cannot be transferred to another. And how do we know that that's the case of what they meant? Well, John Adams explains it. He says there, he, by the way, was a member of the Committee of Five that drafted the uh, Declaration of Independence and presented it to Congress. He said this, and making this understanding indisputable, he explained, I say rights, notice how he's capitalized rights there, they have undoubtedly antecedent to all earthly governments. Before governments existed, these rights existed rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. Note what Adams is saying here. Rights cannot be repealed. Rights cannot be restrained by any human laws. In addition to that witness, we have the Virginia Constitution, which uh, Thomas Jefferson, the chief drafter of the Declaration of Independence, and uh, he had an intimate knowledge of this document, the Virginia Constitution, because they actually put this Constitution into motion before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And in this document, the uh, statement is very clear. The preamble of the Declaration of Rights to their uh, Constitution reads, a declaration of rights made by the good people of Virginia in exercise of their sovereign powers, which rights do pertain to them and their posterity as the basis and foundation of government, that all men are by nature equally free and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. So notice what it's saying here, that all men have rights that cannot by any agreement, that's what a compact is, a constitution or a contract, by any agreement that they can be deprived of. Notice that phrase, cannot by any compact be deprived or divested of those God-given rights. So the Virginia Constitution removes all doubts that uh, we have in the state of nature what is called in the Declaration of Independence unalienable rights, and here it further clarifies them by stating that these rights belong not only to us, but to our descendants, in other words, to everyone born on planet Earth. Everyone on this Earth has what our Declaration of Independence declares as unalienable rights, whether you are an American living in this country or you live in Zimbabwe or any other country of the world. 
Why? Because your rights come from the creator. They do not come from the government, whatever government happens to be in your land. So all people the world over are born with unalienable rights, and no one has the right to take them away or to regulate them or to control those rights. However, of course, this doesn't mean that human civil governments equally protect those God-given rights or even recognize those God-given rights. At this point, some will ask, why is it so important that we understand that we have rights that cannot be restrained or repealed by man-made laws? After all, the modern propagandists will certainly tell us, oh, shouldn't we be reasonable about this? Shouldn't we understand that for, for the good of the whole of society, we need to expect that our government officials must be able to place certain restrictions on our rights, requiring perhaps a qualifying license to exercise that or a, a, a permit of some kind, or maybe completely denying that right altogether for whatever reason they deem. While today many people in our society seem to feel this way, let's examine what our founders thought about that idea because it's evident from what they wrote that they were very, very much opposed to that idea. And the reason they were opposed to that idea is at root, the idea of inalienable or unalienable rights has biblical roots. It's from God's commands. For example, Amos chapter 5 clearly states, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. By the way, the gate in their day was the center of civil government. It's kind of like the courthouse today or uh, uh, like the, the, the capital or the, or the state house. Now, justice here is doing that which is right according to the creator, not according to any man-made standard, but by the creator's standard. You recall we've previously stated God's commands in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, and uh, therefore you have a right to life. God commands it. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not covet, and therefore you have a right to property. God's law uh, establishes that. And then he also directed us at Exodus 21, thou shalt not man-steal, or what we would say is kidnapping. So our unalienable rights come from the negative commandments given in the Ten Commandments and the other scriptures that speak of them. They cannot be alienated from us because they're part of the unchanging character of God. Malachi 3 speaks of God as being an unchanging being. His character doesn't change, therefore his law does not change. So not only do we have an obligation not to violate the rights of our fellow man, we also have a responsibility, as this says, to protect the rights uh, of our fellow man, as we pointed out in the last lecture. So who are we to claim that the Word of God, the creator of the universe, is not valid law, and that we have somehow a right to rule in his place and to overthrow his law and put ours in, in, in its place? You see, the fact of the matter is, we're either going to be ruled by God's law given to us in his word, or we're going to be ruled by the will of the tyrannical human being, right? We will either stand up for biblical justice, or we will be ruled by the arbitrary will of our fellow human being who is a tyrant. Now, just because we delegated our God-given authority to fulfill our obligations, if we delegated that to our representatives in government, that no way relieves us of our obligations as God's word clearly commands us. See, under God's law, we're still under those obligations. Yes, they are our servants, our civil servants, but if they're acting outside of God's authority, if they're acting outside of the authority we have granted to them, it is up to us to resist them. It is us, up to us to rein them in, and God will hold us accountable for that responsibility he has given to us. You look back at the Virginia Constitution, it states that the people there are sovereigns. You might correct that and say they're sub-sovereigns. God is ultimately sovereign. Humans, though, have sovereignty, and the sovereignty of the citizen is over the civil government, greater than the civil government. And the citizen sovereigns have the ultimate responsibility to ensure that our civil servants do not exceed that limited authority that we have delegated to them. Now, many people within the modern church teach that, you know, we should be willing to give up our rights just to do so for the common good, the benefit of everyone else. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. In fact, exactly the opposite. Look at Psalm 82, where it says, Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. All of that involves defending God-given rights, not giving up God-given rights. How can a Christian 
do what we're commanded here in Scripture? How can we establish justice in government if we refuse to become involved in the political process? David Barton was sharing a statistic that's just shocking. Tens of millions of people who profess to be Christians in our country have not even bothered to register to vote, let alone voting in any election. They haven't even bothered to register to vote. They are not part of the process. They are part of the problem. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, several statements clearly uh, remind us of this. Speaking of those in civil power, those who are in that position, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Later on in the chapter says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. This is commands given from one end of Scripture to the other. The prophet Jeremiah makes another scathing rebuke. Among my people are wicked men who lie in wait like men who snare birds and like those who set traps to catch men. Like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. They have become rich and powerful and have grown fell on a nation such as this. You see, if we the people are the sovereigns, as that Virginia Constitution and many other state constitutions make that same point, aren't we then ultimately responsible for what we allow our civil servants to do? They are our servants, whether they recognize it or not. And what they do, we are responsible for. Prophet Jeremiah in Lamentations said, to crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny a man his rights before the Most High, to deprive a man of justice, would not the Lord see such things? So God doesn't give us an, op an option to turn a blind eye to these things. He doesn't give us an option not to be involved in the political arena when we are, see our so-called civil servants using the force of law to desecrate the rights of others. Doesn't a man have a right to the fruit of his own labor? Isn't it theft if we force someone to, and we take from that man what he has earned and we give it to someone else? Isn't that a form of theft? Isn't it a violation of the law of liberty to interfere with the actions of another person unless or until they have in some way violated the equal rights of others or God's moral law? Does not godly love require us to look out for the rights of others? You see, in the New Testament, we see Jesus doing this very clearly with his zeal, as he said, for his father's house. He showed love and compassion for those being robbed, and he drove the culprits away by making a whip. It made, he made a whip, whipped it at those evildoers. If you look at Matthew chapter 21, it describes that scene. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I think it's a poignant question for us. Are our local, state, and federal officials little more than a den of thieves today, depriving those who have earned, rightfully earned, the fruits of their labor, deprive them of enjoying those fruits and redistributing that wealth to ensure what? To ensure their own reelection? Because they know that the people that receive those goodies are certainly going to vote for them the next time around. Where's the indignation? that God demonstrates in his word, the indignation of the average Christian in regard to this so-called legalized plunder practiced by our government. It should be there. Jesus demonstrated it there in the temple. Do you know that Jesus actually broke the civil code of his day by overturning those tables, by driving out uh, those buyers and the sellers? He was driving out the legalized plunderers, and yet it was against the so-called law, the pretended legislation of his day. You could read the account. And the Jewish leaders were very upset. In fact, one of the reasons they crucified Jesus was because of that exact uh, action that he took in the temple. These money changers were sanctioned by the temple authorities to do that activity they were doing. And they challenged Jesus and asked Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Jesus' answer is, by God's law, by God's authority, he was doing these things. And therefore, as Christians, when we're challenged sometimes by being involved in the political process, you know, we can have complete confidence 
that the idea of God-ordained rights is very much in line with the biblical teaching from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We can be assured that Jesus himself took action based upon defending the God-given rights of the people there in the city of Jerusalem. Every citizen has the right to the fruit of their own labor. They have a right not to be interfered with unless they have violated the rights of other people, their God-given rights, or violated God's moral law. God vindicated that when he wrote it in stone. Thou shalt not steal. On the other hand, the only rights you may have, according to the secularist or the progressive of our day, or well, probably the best label for them, the statist, that they believe the state is God, they would say, you know, the state grants you privileges, and it's the state granting you those privileges. The state's philosophy is that all power and all authority originates in the state. Well, wouldn't that make Jesus Christ out to be a sinner when he opposed the state and opposed their pretended legislation? Well, I believe it's time for Christians to stand in the gate, that is, in the seat of civil authority, and promote godly justice according to God's law. The Word of God says in Isaiah chapter 1, Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now, what are the practical consequences of this? Though not immediately apparent to most people, the principle of unalienable rights is arguably the second most important concept of the freedom that sets America apart from all other nations on the face of the earth. This precept of unalienable rights is so unique and so precious to freedom-loving citizens everywhere that if rightly understood and rightly apply, applied, it prevents those in government from infringing on an individual's right to control their own life, liberty, and property. And that's exactly why so many people from every corner of the world for more than two centuries have flocked to these shores to obtain, as Simeon Howard described it, liberty to pursue their own happiness. As history has proven, the free enterprise system based upon this principle of unalienable rights as practiced in early American history is the most productive supplier of human needs and economic justice that mankind has ever known. This God-ordained economic system of men keeping the fruits of their labor and controlling their life and their property has produced the greatest economic prosperity for the greatest number of people. You see, the free enterprise system is based on blessing your fellow man, and it only rewards you to the degree you have blessed others. It's based on how much you bless others you receive uh, in return. For example, let's say that you sell one cup of coffee. There's a certain expense involved in that, but what you have done is blessed another person. How do you know you've blessed them? Well, obviously, that customer would not change their money for your cup of coffee if it was not seen to be a good deal for them, if it was not seen to be a blessing. So in that trade, you have blessed them, they have blessed you. Now, what if you sell five cups of coffee? You make a little more money because money, you've blessed five people and they in turn bless you. What if you sell 500 cups of coffee? Well, then you make even a little bit more. What if you sell you know, 50,000 cups of coffee? Well, then you make a good deal more because you have blessed that many more people. The more you sell and the more you bless other people, the more you are going to be blessed in return. Now, why should anybody be upset if you are blessing others and they, in turn, are blessing you in, in return? They shouldn't be upset by that at all unless in their heart they have a root of covetousness. They want what they do not deserve. You see, you shouldn't be blessed, they would tell you, based on how much you bless others. Well, why not? This is the free enterprise system in action. The free enterprise system requires only a willingness for people to work, which some days is you know, rather lacking in people, a, what a willingness to work, an idea of how to help others, and then the ability to put that idea into action, and finally, that you have the freedom, that is, nobody's going to restrict you and prevent you from blessing other people and from them blessing you in return. The type of freedom needed for this free enterprise system to work uh, is exactly the freedom guaranteed by the government envisioned and crafted by our founding fathers. This principle of the government protecting the right of individual to participate in that free enterprise system is summed up in what our founders called Republican, that's small r, it's not the political party, Republican form of government. 
Thomas Jefferson therefore proclaimed it this way, the true foundation of Republican government is the equal right of every citizen in his person and property and in their management. That's the free enterprise system. The statist or the mercantile old world thinking and the modern politician would say, Thomas Jefferson is crazy. That's not an acceptable view. This status or so-called so progressive concept uh, that it takes a village to do anything, you know, that is a failed system. It has never worked in the history of man. Why? Because it's based on a violation of God's law. It is based on theft, taking the fruits of another person's labor to give it to someone else who is unworthy of it. The only people whom statism actually works for is the people who are in charge of it. In other words, when the thieves are running the program, they benefit from the program, right? Because they have all the so-called legalized plunder in their hands, they are the ones benefiting from it. Under this system, there's simply no incentive for the average person to work because a great deal of everything you wind up producing is taken from you by the government and given to others. Few people will choose to work unless there's some motivation, usually a material incentive outside the work itself. The desire for that material reward is by far the most powerful and the most sustaining reason for work. So in spite of our best efforts as an average citizen, the free enterprise system for most of us will not cause us to uh, accumulate vast wealth. Nevertheless, this free enterprise system, based on the philosophy of unalienable rights, is the most honest and the most just economic system mankind has ever experienced because it's based on God's law. This free enterprise system also makes it possible for some of us to enjoy true luxuries of life and experience prosperity unknown previously anywhere to common man. More important than that, however, it enables the rest of us to raise our standard of living in far in excess of what is possible under any other system. And the reason why that for the first 160 years, America was turned into a howl, from a howling wilderness into one country that was envied by the rest of the world, particularly the statist old world. Well, the choice is up to us. Will we choose to restore and work to restore our republic that will secure unalienable rights, or will we allow ourselves to further degenerate into what our founders called a mobocracy, that is a system where the ever-changing will of the majority rules, and where the majority constantly votes for the politician that will give them the most out of the public treasury, which is really out of the pockets of the people producing something? where the needs of the many are funded by the ability and the hard work of the few. That system God always calls theft. It becomes a never-ending cycle of tax and spend until all is ultimately owned and controlled by those thieves that are running the government. This leads to absolute totalitarianism. You see, government regulation, which we're told is very good and is going to help us all. No, government regulation is the statist pathway to totalitarian control because it destroys freedom, it brings about economic chaos, oppression, and it destroys prosperity. Let us not acquiesce to their excuse of necessity. That is always their plea for every infringement of human liberty. It appears that it's the slogan of most politicians today, necessity, necessity, necessity. Many, including myself, are sick and tired of hearing from the modern political pundits of the idea that unalienable rights, those are impractical in a modern society. They're old-fashioned. Well, that's the creed of the status of the old world, which our forefathers clearly rejected so many years ago. The reason they crossed the Atlantic to these shores was to reject that status mentality. The free enterprise system is based on this principle of unalienable rights of work and keeping the fruit of your labor. James Madison proclaimed it this way, Government is instituted to protect property of every sort. This being the end of government, that alone is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where the property which a man has in his personal safety and personal liberty is violated by arbitrary seizure of one class of citizens for the service of the rest. Oh, he could see our day very, very clearly, could he not? If those who work are allowed to keep the fruit of their labor and dispense the surplus as they see fit, not as anybody else, as they see fit, then what will happen? They will work harder, they will work longer, they will invest, they will invent, they will produce more than you could have ever dreamed possible. There will be more for everyone, including those who, because of life circumstances, have to depend upon the charity of others. Well, the choice before us is very clear. 
You see, we as individuals and as families and as churches will either defend the American principle that our founders clearly stood upon, that our rights come from God, not from government. And therefore, they are not subject to repeal or the restriction of any human laws. We'll either restore that or our current government-regulated and controlled economic system will finally completely destroy our economy and destroy the most prosperous nation that the world has ever known. Thank you.